indeed my um, my introduction was uh, designed to be an introduction on the bigger at Aulam project, but now it also links uh, both the presentation we just uh, heard about uh, of Yarik and then the one which will come of Dieter. And so um, at Aulam is indeed a, a new project running until 2024, and it responds um, and uh, Dieter, you can go to the next slide. It responds to one of the new biases we as researchers are facing. As a historian, we are very much trained to detect preservation biases, but gradually also in research, there are some digitization biases in which things might seem different or the historical realities might seem different through um, different choices of digitization. So we have two great projects in Leuven, uh, which have already been introduced. Um, but on the one hand, there's Magister Dixit, which is focusing on manuscripts and this brings the students to the fore. And then you have the Lovanientia um, digitization um, project focusing on rare books, printed matter, and it brings the scholars to the fore. So if we go to the next slide, then we see that there's um, unintentionally a bias uh, which is created by the digitization imperative. And I think one of the main breakthroughs is that we now have the uh, triple IF viewer. So you can actually in the same single viewer compare both the manuscripts and the uh, printed books, but that um, doesn't solve uh, the fact that there's a kind of suggestion that the student writes and that the professor or the scholar publishes. Um, and then, of course, we have also this um, remaining preservation bias of the dominant gaze or the dominant um, corpus of uh, student notes from the arts faculty. So the At Aulam project uh, tries to um, address some uh, little steps, some of these issues. Um, you just heard Yarik, which is uh, who is the PhD student working on uh, the teaching of theology. There are three other PhD students present now, uh, which is Ana Luisa. Uh, whom you heard yesterday intervening uh, in the Q&A after Anne Blair's uh, keynote lecture. There's Siri and there's Pedro working on teaching of law in early modern Louvain. And then uh, you will hear the um, now Dieter presenting as fifth PhD student on the printed textbooks. And what he will be doing, Dieter, you can go to the next slide is um, actually dressing for Leuven, because we don't have that yet, uh, an overview of uh, the printed textbooks. And um, this corresponds with earlier book historical projects I've been coordinating. Um, as Raf said, I'm, I'm triggered by Borderland. So um, we've actually started by the University of Douai, which today is in France, but used to be Habsburg Low Countries. So we have already in our uh, databases everything published in the way, whether for the university or the city. This is fully online, so I would really invite you to consult our ECC database. And the second data set, um, we decided to focus um, explicitly on the gender dimension of printing and the academic milieu. So uh, our second data set is, is uh, by Helene Bevels, a doctoral student on women printers. And actually in the academic milieu, they're often the most visible women um, participating in the transmission of knowledge. Um, so half of the uh, data set is already online. For Actually, not yet the, the part on live, but we are working on that. Um, and then, Dieter, you can go to the next slide, um, which shows that these data sets um, are working towards bigger data in the humanities. So this is not yet um, what data scientists would consider to be bigger data, but we have in the back office about 10,000 records covering both the way um, Leuven and Antwerp, and we are linking persons, um, institutions, and books. And then, uh, Dieter, you can go to the last slide, which presents your new data sets, which uh, we gave immediately a name. We baptized it as Manuale Lovaniense. It's um, still in the ODIS infrastructure. We are compiling it, but there's within Lexio, um, which is our overarching uh, think tank or consortium, 
um, um, a tendency to now think how to integrate all the different results and all the different data of um, all our work on students, scholars and books. There's a clear horizon for doing that because in uh, 2025, the Leuven University will celebrate its 600 years since its foundation. Um, and we will actually in Lexio already prepping um, now this celebration to be ready with our book in 2025. So uh, the next annual conference of Lexio will be on, um, on this theme on Leuven as a, a, one of the nodes in the global web of knowledge. Um, it will be hosted in December 2022, and um, I hope that some of you will be able to attend and then in real life. But without further ado, I will now give the floor to uh, Dieter. Thank you, Violet, for the nice introduction. So as Anne mentioned earlier today, our printed textbook played a central role in teaching at the Faculty of Art during the 16th century. Being uh, interested in book history, I intend to study the full circulation of books throughout the society. And before studying how and if these, students, these textbooks were indeed used at the Faculty of Arts, I find it necessary to investigate how these textbooks were produced and circulated throughout the learning society. But also take a look at their appearances, because both can answer of can prove some insights in how they were used eventually by students. In doing so, I will introduce three book historical methods that are able to provide answers to those questions and proving themselves crucial when studying textbooks. So, okay. The tracing networks behind the production of Leuven textbooks means identifying people, which is possible through the method of, so of sociality. Sociality is an, an, a concept added in 2017 by Daniel Bellingrad and Jeroen Salomon to the communication circuit of Robert Darnton, making the circuit more suitable to study the movements of books throughout society and bringing the circuit also more in line with current book historical research. Sociality encompasses all human involvement in the human in the intellectual and material production of textbooks, circulation of textbooks and consumption of these textbooks. And it, by looking at the also looking at book people, such as printers, papermakers, bookbinders, booksellers, etc., it broadens the scope from only studying authors and readers. So basically, sociality explores the social practices in the world of the book, meaning it investigates collaboration and interactions between individuals. So sociality can also be used on student notebooks. And here we see a sketch from a student notebook on logic dating from 1481 to 1482. And the notebook was from the student Theodoricus Regis, who studied at the pedagogy of the Lily. On the left, we can see the intellectual production with these three teachers. And the student Theodoricus Regis played only a secondary role in the intellectual production of this notebook because he copied the words of the student or he copied pieces of text beforehand because students were required to bring their own book to the public lectures. Regis was the central figure in the material production because he decided how he, the, the, his gatherings were bounded together. And he was also the one who bought the paper, probably with a bookseller or with a Beethoven faculty. And Regis also was a central, played a central role in the distribution and consumption of the manuscript as he used it to learn about logic and to prepare for disputations and exams. And also he was a distributor because at the end of his studies, he could either take it home with him, loan it to another student or sell it to another student. So what becomes clear from society, from the student notebook is that there are a rather small, a rather small number of people involved and a central role for the student. For the printed textbooks, however, the picture could be entirely different, as we can see from this sketch, from uh, the first printed textbooks with, uh, from the Faculty of Arts and uh, Dirk Martes from 1509. It contains the text from the Isagoga of Porphyrius and all the necessary works on logic from Aristotle. So the, what we can see immediately is that the intellectual production is in hands of 12 people who were present at the, board, at the meeting of the board of the Faculty of Arts, being the dean, some regions of the, of the different pedagogies, two witnesses and four representatives, and then Dirk Martens. 
So it becomes clear from the sociality that this, the textbook, even the student was not involved in the intellectual, intellectual and material production of the textbooks. And the student was also not involved in distribution of the textbook because Derek Martes had to sell uh, 1,200 copies of the textbook to the Beadle of the Faculty of Art, who uh, subsequently sold the textbook to a copy to everybody who wanted a copy. Is the difference between sociality from a textbook and sociality from a notebook is that is the, there are more social practices between individuals with a printed textbook, make, meaning it moves more through the, the urban society than a notebook. The, while the notebook stayed in the, stayed in the realm of the pedagogy, either you hope for the printing or the making and the printing of a textbook, different so, and people from different social backgrounds collaborated, bring academics and craftsmen together. Some of these Actors in the society are difficult to identify without an intensive book archaeological research. For instance, the papermaker of the bookbinder is important to identify in that manner. So there are a lot of names for studying the materiality of student notebooks of manuscripts and also books. There is book archaeology, there is code ecology, there is an analytical and descriptive and textual bi bibliography. But there are also two concepts which I want to introduce now. It's the mise en livre and the mise en page, which grew in popularity for the last decade. Although often used intertwined, I would argue there is a difference between the two of them, because mise en livre focuses solely on the physical, the bigger physical appearances, such as the format and the cover the binding as well of some watermarks, as well as on the context, just investigating which texts were present in a textbook, in which order those, those texts were printed in the textbook, and also looking if there are certain paratext in the, in, the, in the book, and also if there was, for instance, an index. If you look at the mise en page, it's coming up in the history of reading, when, and it looks at the layout of a page or a folio if you study it for a notebook. And it means that you look at the letters used, the number of lines for uh, the printed text, if there were titles and if there were marginalia in the, in the uh, present in the on the pages and the folios. So, if you look at the mise en livre a comparison between the, the, an edition of 1525 and an edition of 1532, I had to use these editions because they're from the textbook of 1509. There are no uh, copies preserved at the, at the moment. But these are reprints and are probably the same edition and are, are identical to the textbook from 1509. So what you can see from this table is that the both editions are printed in the in folio format. And there are only small differences in the height and the width of the paper between the two. I also included uh, the format of the notebook from 1581 and 1582, which shows, and I mentioned it earlier, it also was used large format. So it's not very surprising that the two textbooks were printed in, in folio format, as the all the, all the reprints appearing of the, those textbooks were all in between in, in the, the 16th century, were all printed in, in folio format. And the uh, edition from 1509, the members of the Faculty of Arts clearly wanted that Dirk Martes printed the textbooks in the in folio format. Uh, here, here we see three pictures which the mise en livre will show from these, and these are three textbooks, that the text, in, uh, the, uh, the text in these textbooks are identical. So there is a continuity between printed textbooks. The picture on the left is the, the, is the Logica Vecus from, this is the first page of the Isagogen of Profeer from the Logica Vecus, printed by Dirk Martis and Johannes Westphalen in 1474. The middle picture is the First page of the Isagoge from Profier is from the edition of 20, 1525, printed by Derek Martis. And the picture on the right is the same as the edition from 1532, from printed by Servatius in Sossius. As we can see, all three textbooks contain the exact same text, meaning there is a continuity between those textbooks, in, in which continuity between those textbooks. Another thing that we can see from the middle between the editions from 1525 and 1532 is that the order of the text is completely identical, though the text contained and the order is completely identical. Yeah. Taking a look at the mise en page of these two editions, we can also see there are just some minor differences. The height of the text and the width of the text printed in the textbooks is, is 
quite the same. The biggest difference is that there are the number of lines used, while the addition of 1525 only used 34 lines, the addition of 1532 used 37 lines. I also compared it with the notebook of 1482, 1481, and 1482, and again, not many differences show themselves. The only difference is here that the student decided to either write in one column or in two columns, and that he used a different number of lines in the writing of these columns. Then you compare the mise en page of the edition of 1525 and 1532, you immediately see that there are very big similarities. And again, there is some continuity about the mise en page. For the text element, she says the titles, the initials at the beginning of each new lemma, and the printed glosses in the margins are identical and always in the same place. The small differences that occur are a direct result of the number of lines the printer decided to use. So you can see, for instance, that there is a different custody in addition of Derek Martens than in the addition of Servalsi Sosnius that is directly related to using 34 lines or 37 lines. We can also see that there is an insertion of wide margins around the text, which is also specifically aimed at offering students the opportunity to write around the text in their, in their printed textbooks during the public lectures. Both pictures indeed show that there are handwritten notes around uh, those printed text, and by cross-checking the provenances available in these two textbooks with the records of matriculation of the old University of Louvain, it becomes clear that both students owned these editions. But there are also some difficulties because we have a lot of different hands on, on some pages, and it is also never very clear if they are indeed written by a student or which students have wrote them down. So to conclude, when using book historical mass met methods and book archaeology, logical methods of sociality, mise en livre and mise en page, it answers questions, but it brings up also new questions and brings gives up new opportunities to study in the data. Manuel Lovandien says this is a database that strives to bring together the socialities of the D and Lovain textbooks. And then subsequently, these data can be studied more intensely through a social network analysis, probably possibly revealing returning relations between printers, professors, students, and faculties. The mise en livre and the mise en page revealed consistency in the textbooks, and this raises the question how and why these textbooks became fixed throughout the 16th century. Talking about fixed books brings us to a discussion, a well-known discussion among book historians between Elizabeth Eisenstein and Ailey and Jones about why these fixed texts became important. And Eisenstein would argue that it's mostly because of the printing press. Ailey and Jones is a bit more nuanced and I follow his theory that the fixed texts happen because actors in production and consumption wanted this. Jones offers also a solution to to provide an answer for the for the new for the question on the fixed text and by suggesting to investigate collaboration between printers and academics, which brings us back to the method of sociality, proving that sociality is a crucial method for studying printed textbooks at the old University of Louvain. The biggest question is, of course, if these printed textbooks were indeed used and how they were used by students and professors. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much uh, to both uh, Dieter and Violet for a wonderful uh, presentation uh, on the verge of book history and social network analysis and digital humanities with the, the database to which we are all looking forward to, to consult it. Uh, will be also very useful for, for uh, our Advantes team uh, because it will include the print production of, of, of Leuven, which also uh, refers to the three languages, of course. Um, I uh, see already many hands raised, so I'm going to give the word to Xander, who was first, apparently. Uh, uh, thank you, Violet and Dieter, uh, for the nice presentation of the database. It sounds very promising. Um, I have a, a, a very general question, uh, Dieter, for you, uh, namely, what does uh, a textbook constitute for you? Uh, because at a, a, a cert, at, at a certain point, you said that Martens was the first of the, or the most prominent uh, printer at the beginning of the 16th century to print for the artists. But Johann Westphalia of John of Westphalia was equally important uh, 
some 40 years earlier, and he printed, for example, the great classics of Virgil and Horace. Do you also uh, perceive these as textbooks, yes or yes or no? Because uh, you, you mainly focused on, on, on logic um, and, and the other art tests uh, that were certainly taught in the vein, but we should not forget that also poetry was taught um, uh, at the art tests about which we actually know nothing at all. So yeah, that's uh, just some thoughts that were going through my head that, that I would like to ask you. It's, I know it's a very general, perhaps different question to ask, but yeah. Yeah, that's indeed a good question, but the meaning of Manuel and Van Jense is to bring together these, the textbooks from the Faculty of Arts, mainly logic, physical, mm. and the, and the okay. sphere, for instance. And then the, if there was were textbook used at the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Theology. Mm. And uh, indeed, Martis was uh, the first textbooks was indeed printed with a collaboration between Dirk Martis and Westphalen and Johannes of Westphalen. And then Johannes of Westphalen takes a bit over in, and moves to Leuven and becomes a more dominant printer there. But then uh, once Martis comes back at the beginning of the, uh, the 16th century, he becomes the printer who starts printing textbooks for the Faculty of Art. But when he stops printing, his son in law Servatius in Sassanus takes over. And when Servatius I Sassanus dies, his widow takes over. So it's kind of family affair of printing these textbooks, but that's only for textbooks that were ordered by the Faculty of Arts, or because there is a clear, a clear connection that the Faculty of Arts wanted these, print, these textbooks to be printed so students could use them. In a way, there is a theory of Jan Rogiers if these textbooks were indeed used, because he sees them, them replacing the student notebooks. I see it more of a gray area, because when you look at the student notes, for instance, the edition of 1525 only has extensive handwritten notes from for the next to the Isagoken of Porphyrius, but nothing from the no handwritten notes with the works of Aristotle, for instance. So it seems to me that it's maybe started with using a printed textbook, but then he decided against it. It's always a, for me a gray area, what, if they were used indeed. By yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Many questions are uh, coming are, uh, by our uh, audience. So Jan is next up, I, I guess. Yeah, is allowed uh, a short question about uh, the Faculty of Arts uh, in their regulations and in their uh, uh, even the, the the notes of their uh, meetings. You can uh, detect that there is a, a sort of uh, monopoly uh, involved. Sometimes they uh, even expel professors who do not use the handbooks which they have paid for. Will you include that uh, element as well in your uh, network? Yes, indeed. I didn't know that. Thank you for uh, giving me this information and I really use that in the networks. Yes. Because that is for me important if you study sociality. If those are things you can uncover, those are very important to know how these were produced and if they were used indeed. Okay, thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Natasha. Uh, sorry, yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this. I um, I was wondering if you if I could follow up on uh, Xander's uh, question um, and and talk about uh, the size of textbooks. Um, how certain are you that these folios are textbooks? And how certain are you that there are other textbooks of no other textbooks of smaller sizes? Um, to my mind, a folio is quite expensive for a student to acquire. So I, I'm just, uh, I would like to, to, to just consider this a little bit more. That's indeed a good question because uh, that's, when I mention that they are in folios, I always get the question that it is a big size and they are indeed expensive to buy for a student. Uh, if you look, but if you look at the comparison with student notebooks, they are roughly the same. And in the contract from 1509, the Faculty of Arts clearly states they want Dirk Martis to print it in an in-folio format and use a certain amount of marginalia, etc., in the, in the textbook. I make also a distinction between this sort of textbooks, which to me are more like printed lecture texts, which are, are just which a student could brought to the public lectures and take some notes around the printed text. 
there are also like uh, painted lecture notes from a student or from, from a professor, and these exist also in Leuven. From this, you have some some examples from Leuven professors who, who printed the textbook, and those are always in smaller folds. There's are more than a octavo or even a quarto. There are even some differences between if it's printed in Leuven and it's mostly a quarto. A quarto. And in, in Antwerp, in for instance, it's mostly an octavo. But those are different in comparison with the printed lecture text I was talking about today, because I see for the introductory textbooks, not really a place in public lectures, but more for private study. Okay. Okay, well, uh, just uh, from my point of view, because I study Greek textbooks, a lot of the Greek textbooks are smaller in sizes. Uh, so that it's a very different picture from what you're describing. But thank you very much. Thank you. And, and following up on the size, so I think Leuven is kind of like a, an example apart because the size of the notebooks, it's only on, on, until the, third, uh, the 18th century, it decreases. So indeed, in the 16th century, it's still... Uh, quite large compared to to other centers. So uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then our last question by Anne Blair. Hi everyone, and this pertains also to Yarek's topic, which was of a later period. But it's wonderful to see the the discussion of the use of print. And um, do they talk about, does the Faculty of Arts, I mean, you're looking at some of those archival records, right, where you have minutes of their discussion and they're deciding to, you know, request this and that of the printer. Are there any misgivings about how printing, the use of printed textbooks is going to change student practices? And then, you know, that question I had pending from reading Yarek's, um, you know, why do they suspend um, the use of printed textbooks so late in the 17th century, in 1617, and is there discussion around that? That sounded like more of a, you know, sort of a top-down decision that was imposed on them. But do you ever, do they discuss, as we do, you know, taking notes by typing and notes by handwriting is better. And you know, you get these studies that are contradicting each other, honestly. But anyways, um, I'm just curious whether this comes up at the time. They're aware of using the new technology. Do they have concerns about it? Uh, for the Faculty of Arts, I haven't looked at the reports of the meeting for for that, but I do know the, that for the Faculty of Law, there is one professor who clearly saw the advantages of printed textbooks for using them during the lectures because it uh, made sure that students didn't always have to write and it, and it was able to discuss more subjects because of using the printed textbooks. For uh, the Faculty of Theology, I've discussed a lot of that with Yarik already, and we don't see that much room for the use of printed textbooks during at the Faculty of Theology. Faculty of Law, will, for me, I believe, will also be in certain cases of professors who see the advantage. And the Faculty of Arts is, uh, is indeed more because of those printed lecture texts. There is a connection with the Faculty of Arts and printers who wanted them. And I will explore that more in detail. And for the visitation of 1617, I can't, uh, I also know the basic literature about it, so I can't tell more about it for now. Maybe to follow up, uh, because that's also something which keeps on intriguing me, this ban on like printed works for education. And that's why originally we had set the deadline of the corpus of uh, Manuale Lovaniense to that ban. Uh, but one of the first things that Dieter discovered while retrieving all the information was that the ban at, at least wasn't respected that much. So uh, we are now in, uh, we are now thinking to enlarging the corpus until 1640, because uh, certainly for the Faculty of Law again, there was certainly a need for um, for printed textbooks. So. Um, I think at the end of this project, we will understand the ban better. Like now it's it's seen in literature as something which is normative and followed, uh, but maybe our evidence will point to, to like multiple dynamics in different faculties going on at the same time. Very complicated, which is fun. Thank you.